Mike, it's uh, it's great to be here with the Civil War Roundtable Congress. Uh, I know because of your name that you normally get pure Civil War talks, and I've done a few of those myself. I've written a couple of books on Gettysburg. And so when people from the Roundtable started reaching out to me about this book, I, was, I, I said, you know, this isn't a Civil War book per se. And the, almost all of them said, no, no, it, it's great American history, though. It's from the same era. We're all history fans. And the Armistead name means a lot to people who, who study the Civil War. So I really do appreciate uh, this opportunity. And I, I do want to say the idea for this book did come out of the Civil War in a way, because it came out of the movie Gettysburg. Uh, we're now on the 30 year anniversary of that movie. It really impacted me. I watch it all the time. But there was a scene, one of the many fictitious scenes in that movie, right before the start of Pickett's Charge, where Louis Armistead is talking to the British military observer, Colonel Arthur Fremantle. And Fremantle says, I understand you're from an illustrious military family. And Armistead's getting ready for an attack. He doesn't want to talk about that stuff. He grunts and he says, who told you that, Kemper? And Fremantle says, he tells me that your uncle was the commander of Fort McHenry in the War of 1812, and therefore was the guardian of the original Star Spangled Banner. And Fremantle looks across the field to Cemetery Ridge, he sees the American flags flying above the Union troops that Armistead is about to attack. And he says, I do appreciate the irony of it all. And that scene really struck me when I saw the movie. I've thought about it ever since. And I think that ultimately just seeing that, and I was researching an earlier book on Lewis Armistead. And I thought this story about George Armistead and the flag really has to be told. So that that's a long, long way of saying the Civil War impacted uh, uh, this research project. So when we hear the phrase Star Spangled Banner, the first thing we think about is the national anthem. But those words are so familiar to us. We've memorized them as little kids. We've heard it throughout our lives, sporting events and the like. Then when we sing those words or mouth those words or hum those words, we don't really think what they mean. I mean maybe land of the free and home of the brave, but otherwise not so much. But there's a key line in there. And uh, that's not a clever pun on the man who wrote the lyrics. Uh, it's key line. Our flag was still there. The song, our anthem, is about a flag. It's the flag that Francis Scott Key saw waving over Fort McHenry in Baltimore on the morning of September 14, 1814, after he had witnessed a 25-hour bombardment of that fort by the British Navy. Key was out on the water behind the British. We'll talk in a little bit about why he was there. But it's misty. It had been raining all night. He and his boatmates weren't sure who won the battle. Which flag through the mist were they going to see, a British flag or an American flag? And they see an American flag. And Key is so inspired that he takes some notes. And two days later, he finishes a song that 117 years later becomes our national anthem. But Star Spangled Banner has also come to be a generic term for any American flag. You Google Star Spangled Banner and you'll go to pictures, go to images, and you'll see lots of pictures of the modern 13-stripe 50-star flag, much the Olympics or other events, international sports events. Now, announcers will say the Star Spangled Banners are flying in the crowd. But that's the flag. That's the original Star Spangled Banner that Key saw in 1814. It's still there. It's at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. It's tattered. It's torn. It's really thin. It's got holes in it. One of the stars is missing. It's eight feet shorter than it used to be. But it still survives. One of the most iconic pieces of early American history. And when they were doing the most recent rehab project about 15 years ago at the Smithsonian, the chief conservator said they viewed the flag as a metaphor for the country. It's tattered, it's torn, it's faced so many challenges, but it still survives. The flag survives as the country survives. And that inspired them. And that actually inspired me as I, as I was doing this, this research and writing. Now, the flag exists in the first place because of this man. That's George Armistead, Uncle George. Uh, it was an illustrious military family. George and three of his brothers were all professional U.S. Army officers in the War of 1812, including Lewis Armistead's father. George got command of Fort McHenry in 1813. Uh, the War of 1812, which you probably know, is woefully misnamed. It only began in 1812. It lasted for three years. The first couple of years did not go well for the Americans. Repeated beatings by the British, especially up in Canada, where most of it was fought. But one of the early successes came in the spring of 1813 at a place called Fort George on the Niagara River, and the artillery hero was George Armistead. 
he uh, was given the honor, his performance was so strong, given the honor of presenting captured British battle flags to President James Madison down in D.C. Madison's ecstatic. And Madison and his cabinet are thinking, you know, the war is going to come down here to our country. We, we need to start protecting our, our cities and our ports. And Baltimore is a, a decent sized city today. It was the third largest city in the country back then. Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore. Bustling international port, Fort McHenry defended that harbor. It was a very important site. And Madison knew that an Armistead had served there before the war. He married a Baltimore lady, so all of this made sense. Armistead gets the position. The first thing he does, the very first thing he does, he wants a flag so large the British can't help but see it from a distance. He always had a thing about big flags. So it begins really at this time when the war is not going well as a symbol of defiance. Uh, but also confidence. This is what we're fighting for, boys. You know, you hear in sports, my background is sports, that managers and coaches want to develop a culture in their locker room. Well, that's the culture that George Armistead was trying to create at Fort McHenry. Well, he did some other things, obviously. He had to increase recruiting, really improve some of the physical defenses, but the flag was going to be very important. Now, the assignment went to a Baltimore seamstress and flag maker named Mary Pickerskill. There she is, photo later in life. She's 37 years old at this time. Not Betsy Ross, folks. Drives me crazy. People think Betsy Ross does this. Mary Pickerskill, the name, does not roll off the tongue like Betsy Ross does, but Mary made this flag. She actually made two flags. That was the order. One gigantic garrison flag, 30 feet high by 42 feet wide. British couldn't help but see that. And a slightly smaller storm flag, 17 feet high by 25 feet wide. Storm flag would fly during inclement conditions. If the big flag flew during a rainstorm, got waterlogged, might get so heavy, it snapped the flagpole. So you needed both of them. It was also in the design of the time, 15 stars and 15 stripes. People have seen the cover of my book, and I come, some have come after me on social media. That's disrespectful. That's not the flag. Don't you know the flag code? This was the style at the time in 1813. We were such a young country, we thought we could add one star and one stripe for each new state. Imagine what the flag would look like today if that continued. It wasn't until 1818 that Congress said, okay, 13 stripes for the original colonies and one new star uh, for each new state. So Mary and her, and her crew get to start to work on this summer of 1813. Very young, all-female crew worked on this famous flag. Her teenage daughter, three teenage nieces, a 13-year-old African-American indentured servant named Grace Wisher. And there was also a slave girl on the premises. We don't know her name or exactly what her role was. She may have helped make the flag. If not, she did the chores so the other women were free to make the flag. But that was the crew that Mary put together. They worked long hours for six weeks, 10, 12-hour days. At one point, the flag got so big, they had to drag it out of Mary's house and take it to a local brewery and spread it out on the floor to work on it there. She's there. She delivers it to Major Armistead at the fort, Fort McHenry, August of 1813. And she's there when it flies up the flagpole for the first time. Armistead's really happy. He's convinced any British patrol will, from the Chesapeake will see it from a distance. But he's got pretty good intelligence that there won't be an attack that fall. The British fleet is going to go south to warmer waters for the winter. We'll see in the spring. Spring of 1814, something happens that really dramatically impacts this war. England had been fighting a concurrent war over in Europe against the other world superpower, France, 20 years for control of the European continent. But now France has been defeated. Napoleon's been captured. This frees up thousands of the best military men in the world to come to the U.S. and deal with these upstart former colonists. It is not looking good for the Americans. One of the first things the British want to do, they want to mount a symbolic attack on the new young capital city of Washington, D.C. It's pretty much not much more than a pastor and a couple of buildings. It won't be well defended, but it's just symbolic. We can do whatever we want. They land 4,700 troops on the Maryland coast. 4,500 are veteran British soldiers just, just off defeating Napoleon in France. But 200 of them were escaped American slaves. The British had taken the moral high ground that spring, put out an announcement that any American slave who could escape to a British ship would be given uh, freedom. And we believe that about 4,000 uh, enslaved people uh, got their freedom that way. Now, they weren't re required to fight, but the men had the opportunity, if they wanted to, to get military training and fight against their former masters. And about 600 of them did. And 200 are part of this campaign. They were in their own unit called the Colonial Marines to distinguish them from the famed British Royal Marines. So they're marching through the Maryland countryside toward D.C. The American Army, which wasn't much more than a ragtag militia, 
uh, put up a defensive line at a place called Bladensburg, Maryland. One of the most humiliating days in American military history, August 24th, 1814. The British blow right through. There's fighting, there's a little bloodshed, but it doesn't take very long. In fact, it's referred to in history not so much as the Battle of Bladensburg as the Bladensburg races. The Americans ran away so quickly. But the, so the British took basically about an hour to reform. That's all continued their march that day and evening into DC. They get there that evening, August 24th, and they march right into the Capitol building, right into the White House. The city's been abandoned. They set fire to both buildings. They don't burn them to the ground, but they do some significant damage. Here is an image of uh, the White House right afterwards. Imagine what this would have done to the American psyche, and that was the British goal. And if you, you tour the White House or Capitol today, you can still see some of this damage. Again, this is August 24th, 1814. Now, the British don't have much else to do in D.C. They just came for this purpose. They leave after about 24 hours. Their next target is much more strategic, the port city of Baltimore. Had they gone immediately, folks, they likely would have been successful. Armistead and his men were not ready. But for reasons I recount in the book, uh, hindsight's 2020. they decided to go back to their ships, reorganize, and the battle won't happen for three weeks. Now, on their way back to the ship, something happens that directly affects the story of our anthem. As they were coming in, uh, when they were on campaign during these times, the British, the foot soldiers would sleep in tents or on the ground, but the officers would take over a nice home in the area. And on the way in, at a place called Upper Marlboro, Maryland, they took over the home of an elderly physician named Dr. William Beans. He treated them well. What was he going to do? They noticed he had a Scottish brogue. And they think, this guy's okay. He's at least going to be neutral. But on the way back, they're going the same way. They're through Upper Marlboro. And a couple of, there's always straggling in armies, a couple of the younger guys lagging behind, looking for booze or loot or whatever. Beans and his friends don't like it. They go out and they capture a couple of them, take them prisoner. Word gets back to the British ships and they are furious. They send a detachment, middle of the night, grab old man Beans out of his bed, shake him, take you to our ships, take you up to Halifax in Canada. We, you may never see your family again. Beans, family, and friends are mortified. They engage an attorney whose name you may recognize, Francis Scott Key, and they ask Key if he'll go and try to negotiate Dr. Beans' release. Key says, I'll try, but they don't know who I am. So he's teamed up with the U.S. prisoner of war exchange agent, Colonel John Skinner. So Key and Skinner are the negotiating team. They get on a boat, Baltimore Harbor, September 3rd. They don't know where the British are somewhere out in the Chesapeake. Takes them four days to find them. They find the fleet September 7th. This is less than a week before the Battle of Baltimore. The British are deep into the planning for that attack. They don't have time to talk, talk to these two guys about the release of the old doctor. It's not going very well for several days. Not until Key pulls out some letters that he's collected from wounded British soldiers at Bladensburg who are being treated well by American doctors. And the Admiral reads them. He says, okay, if you're treating our guys well, well, we'll let the old man go. Key says, great, we'll head back to Baltimore tonight. They say, yeah, not so fast, pal. You've been here, you've been hearing for days us plan this attack on Baltimore. We can't send you back into Baltimore. So you're not going to be a prisoner, but we're just going to detain you on your own ship under guard uh, until we win the battle. And we believe, historians believe they're probably tethered to the Admiral's ship. They may have wanted Skinner nearby. He was technically a U.S. official, and he could maybe accept a surrender, because the British certainly thought they were going to win this battle. The ground war, the Battle of Baltimore actually begins with a ground battle on September 12th. Here is a map of the area. You can see the star. That's where Fort McHenry hit, is at the edge of the harbor, and you can see where the ships are. They're going to be the next day. But lower right corner, it's North Point. That's where they're going to land. They're going to have a, a ground attack driving toward the city. They think they may be able to do it just with the army. But the Baltimore militia fights pretty well. This is not the Bladensburg races. The, they give up some ground, yes, but they stop the British a few miles short of the city. So the British are going to need their Navy the next morning to pound Fort McHenry and the smithereens and get him in the pincer room and take the city. Now, the British Navy was unquestionably the greatest in the world at this time. Uh, their most lethal weapon was a short, stubby thing called a bomb ship. Uh, it's a very simple name. They could fire 200-pound cast iron bombs more than two miles. They had eight of these in their entire worldwide inventory. Five of them were at the mouth of the Patapsco River in Baltimore that morning. Their names Volcano, Terror, Devastation, Etna, Mercury, 
even their names, so they mean business. So they mean business. Volcano fires the first shot 6.30 in the morning on September 13th to gauge the distance. That starts a barrage over the next 25 hours of 1,500 bombs and 700 rockets, these crazy Congreve rockets. They, they weren't accurate at all, mostly just uh, missiles of terror, uh, but red streaks to the sky. The rocket's red glare, pounding Fort McHenry. Do the Americans fire back? Yes, they do, but their guns only have a range of a mile and a half, so they're splashing short, and the British are taunting them. Ah, uh -huh, you can't hit us. Now, there were some times the British did move closer a little bit for accuracy, and Armistead got his men to fire, and they scored some hits, did some damage, but the British just pulled back. So most of this battle, folks, most of this defense was a passive defense. And if you talk to military people, that's the most difficult. You can't do anything about it. You just have to sit and take it. But Armistead and his men were determined they weren't going to give up the fort. This wasn't going to be the Bladensburg races. Now, early afternoon on the 13th, it starts to rain, torrential downpour. Most of the rest of the battle is fought in the rain. What happens? Big flag comes down. Storm flag goes up. Storm flag flies through most of the battle. Now, did Key see the flag overnight? The battle's continuing. We don't know. I mean, the most he gave us were the lyrics of his song. He never wrote in detail about his experience. He never did an interview. He did a speech several decades later, but mostly was about the, the emotion. So, you know, the lyrics say, rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. You can see maybe there was a burst and he could see the flag, but some historians think just the fact that the firing continued meant the battle was going on, the Americans hadn't capitulated, and our flag was still there. We'll never know. Early the next morning, dawn is breaking. His firing has really slackened. The battle is ending. Who's won? Key, Beans, and Skinner are looking through the spy glasses to see a flag. Which flag? And they see an American flag. They probably saw the storm flag. But a few hours later, something happens that directly leads to our anthem. At 9 a.m., there was always a there was always flag raising in military base, but this one was extra special. This was victory and defiance, and the men shouted and cheered, and they played music and fired guns, and they taunted the British. We actually have first-person accounts from an, an American soldier and a British sailor of this moment. The American said, at this time, our morning gun was fired, the flag hoisted, Yankee, Yankee Doodle played, and we all appeared in full view of a formidable and mortified enemy. And a young British sailor, as they were pulling back out of the harbor, said, it was a galling spectacle for the British seamen to behold. As the last vessel spread her canvas to the wind, the Americans hoisted a most superb and splendid ensign on their battery and fired at the same time a gun of defiance. This was the moment, and Key saw it. Now, the British weren't expecting to lose. They weren't sure what they were going to do. It takes them a couple of days to decide we're going to totally pull back. So Key's not released until September 16th, two days after the battle. He sails that night past Fort McHenry, past the flag, takes a hotel in Baltimore, and that night uh, he writes the four verses of his song. Now you surely were taught, as I was taught, we've all heard, I've read millions of times, that Key wrote a poem. He was a, an amateur poet, a bad amateur poet, but he did write poems. And that this poem some of them, there's, wow, this fits exactly to this musical tune, a very difficult tune. What a miracle. Folks, it didn't happen that way. The tune that we know is the Star Spangled Banner. Very familiar to Francis Scott Key and many Americans in 1814. Uh, it was written in the 1770s over in England, uh, ironically. Uh, for an upscale British gentleman's club. You also may have heard that it's a British uh, drinking song, like it was 100 bottles of beer on the wall, but these guys were aristocrats. They would get together for sumptuous dining and fine wine, and they fancied themselves great singers, and they wanted a song to challenge their vocal range. The club was named for the uh, ancient Greek poet Anacreon. It was called the Anacreonic Society. And their theme song was to an Acreon in heaven. Now, folks, I can't sing. Bear with me on this just for effect. I'll do it quickly. To an Acreon in heaven, where he sat in full glee, a few sons of harmony sent a petition that he, their inspire and patron, would be when his answer arrived from the jolly old Grecian. Voice fiddle and flute. I'm not going <laughs> to do the rest. You get the point. 
The society concept was popular, spread across the ocean to the U.S. There were societies in New York and other cities, so the tune was well known. And one thing that happened back then, rather than constantly rewriting music, they would take familiar tunes and merely rewrite the lyrics. And lyrics were rewritten to this song numerous times by 1814, uh, sometimes just for fun, sometimes activism, sometimes politics. One of those popular in the U.S. 1798 for President John Adams to Adams and Liberty, one of the verses, let fame to the world, son America's voice, no intrigues can her sons from their government sever. Her pride is her Adams, his laws are her choice, and shall flourish till liberty slumbers forever. The unite heart in it, on and on and on. See, this is happening over and over. Francis Scott Key himself, folks, wrote lyrics to this tune in 1805, nine years before the Battle of Baltimore. The American Navy won a big battle in the Middle East, Battle of Tripoli. They were honoring one of the heroes down in D.C., and they asked Key to write something to honor this naval hero. And he wrote a song called, When the Warrior Returns. When the warrior returns from the battle afar, the home and the country he nobly defended. A warm be the welcome to gladden his ear, and loud be the joy that his perils are ended. In the full tide of, you know, on and on, here we go. But look at the last two lines. He's rhyming wave and brave. Wave and brave. How's the anthem end? Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. How's this one end? Where mixed with the olive, the laurel shall wave and form a bright wreath for the brows of the brave. Working on concepts. Not only that, but in the third verse, the little known third verse of this little known song, how about this passage? And pale beam the crescent, its splendor obscured by the light of the star-spangled flag of our nation. Francis Scott Key in 1805. So Key is very familiar with this song. He's writing it definitely uh, for, for, for these lyrics. The next day, September 17th, three days after the battle, he was, takes it to the home of his brother-in-law, Judge Joseph Nicholson, who happened to be one of the militia soldiers defending Fort McHenry. Militia sees it, er, I'm sorry, Nicholson sees it, reads it. He's overwhelmed. He says, we have to get this out. Now, the, the Baltimore business is obviously closed during the battle, including the newspapers, but they get a young pressman, opens the office. They do a one-page broadsheet, just a one-page uh, piece of paper with the lyrics, and they make 1,000 copies and take them to the uh, Fort McHenry soldiers and other dignitaries in town. And this, on September 17th, three days after the battle, is the way that it first was presented. See, the title is not the Star Spangled Banner. He never gave his song that title. He never gave it any title. We think it was Nicholson or one of his friends who gave it the very mundane but accurate title of Defense of Fort McHenry. Uh, you also see that it says, Tune, an Acreon in Heaven, three days after the battle. So this was written uh, for, for, for this music. Now, the, the song becomes uh, incredibly popular. But it's not the anthem. There's no national anthem at that time. There are numerous patriotic songs, some left over from the revolution. Yankee Doodle, Hail Columbia, Columbia, the Gem of the Ocean. In uh, Civil War, we have Battle Hymn of the Republic. But the Star Spangled Banner was, was, was quite popular. The Union Army kind of adopted it during the Civil War, would play it uh, entering to uh, liberate Confederate cities. Uh, it, it becomes uh, then by the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, the official anthem of the U.S. military. But it's not until 1931 when a group of veterans groups and patriotic groups, VFW, the American Legion, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Daughters of 1812, get behind a Maryland congressman from Baltimore and push through a bill in, in, in Congress that makes the Star Spangled Banner the official national anthem. So that's the story of the song. What about the flag? Well, Armistead, several years after the battle, he takes the flag down off the flagpole and takes it home as a souvenir in complete violation of army regulations. He basically stole government property, took it home. Um, but it remained in the private possession of the Armistead family for 90 years until George's grandson gave it to the Smithsonian in 1907. That's why it still survives. A rather amazing story. Uh, and, and we know it happened before 1818 because he died in 1818. Uh, Armistead's wife, uh, thought it was probably a heart attack. Armistead's wife thought the condition came on right after the battle, which which makes the sense with it with the the stress he would have felt. So sometime before 1818, this happens. He passes away. Ownership of the flag goes to his wife Louisa, 
She is the longest private owner of the flag, more than 40 years from 1818 to 1861. She guards it zealously. Remember, this flag was, nobody knew it existed. It wasn't known even outside of Baltimore at all. This was not so much them patriotic, but their husband and father's heirloom. It was an important family heirloom. It doesn't even make a public appearance for the first time until 10 years after the battle. 1824, when the Marquis de Lafayette is making his grand tour of the United States, the nation's guest. There are big ceremonies in New York and Philly and Boston. They're coming to Baltimore. Louisa Armistead allows the, the flag to go to Fort McHenry. It flies up the flagpole and someone makes a sign that says, welcome Lafayette to the land of the free and the home of the brave. And sadly, that's the last time that flag ever flew in, from the flagpole at Fort McHenry. I can only document three, maybe four times over the next 30 plus years that it's out in public. A couple of battle anniversaries that made it out. Once an Armistead a relative was running for political office, but that's it. And no one knew much about it outside of the city of Baltimore. Now, Louisa's partner in caring for the flag was her daughter, Georgiana. I think she was named for her father, Georgiana Armistead, born at Fort McHenry in 1817. They did protect and care for the flag, but they did something that we would consider sacrilegious today. They cut off pieces and gave them as souvenirs. I talked to one of the curators at the Smithsonian. They said, I know we, we would be aghast at that today, but don't blame them. This was commonplace back then. This is what they did. Over the years, the Armistead ladies cut away eight feet of that flag. It was originally 30 by 42. Today at the Smithsonian, it's 30 by 34 has a jagged edge and lots of folks see that and they think that's battle damage. It is not battle damage. It's from the Armistead ladies cutting it away. Now, Louisa dies in 1861, just after the start of the Civil War. So by the terms of her will, it was that important. By the terms of her will, possession goes to her daughter, Georgiana. Here is an image of her around that time or just a little bit out of the battle, after the battle. And she's married at the time. Her name is Georgiana Armistead Appleton. And it's really interesting because she and many members of her family are Confederate sympathizers. Of course, her first cousin, Louis Armistead, is a Confederate general. As this group knows, not all that uncommon in Maryland. Maryland's a north, northern state, but it's a border state, a slave state. Maryland sent troops to both the Union and the Confederacy. The Lincoln administration was terrified that Maryland would bolt for the Confederacy, it would not only change the balance of power, but it would physically cut off Washington, D.C. from the rest of the Union. So they had, they had to do whatever they could. They took extreme member, measures. They, they rescinded habeas corpus. You could arrest whoever you wanted, hold him for, for as long as you wanted. They arrested pro-Southern legislators, pro-Southern city officials, pro-Southern newspaper writers, even tried to prevent young men from leaving to join the Confederate Army. They, they got a tip one night that a bunch of men were getting on a ship to go to Richmond. They arrested them, ran 16 names in the paper the next day. One of the names... George Armistead Appleton, the grandson of the hero of Fort McHenry. He had in his back pocket a Confederate flag. He was going to be taken to a big Union prison, but where is he held the first night? Armistead's grandson is a prisoner at Fort McHenry. And it gets better. A week later, they arrest one of the most strident pro-Southern newspaper writers, Frank Key Howard. Frank Key Howard, the grandson of Francis Scott Key. He also is on his way to a big prison, but the first night he's taken to Fort McHenry and he's there on September 13th, 1861, 47 years to the day, to the day that his grandfather saw the bombs bursting in there. He's angry. He wrote a lot about it then and, and later. This is one of the things, uh, one of the passages that he wrote. As I stood upon the very scene of that conflict, I could not but contrast my position with his 47 years before. The flag which he had then so proudly hailed, I saw waving at the same place over victims that, of as vulgar and brutal a despotism as modern times have witnessed. Wow. Five of Howard's brothers, so five of Key's grandsons, were Confederate soldiers. One of them had the eerie name of McHenry Howard. And McHenry Howard was a staff officer for Stonewall Jackson and Richard Buell. Now, during this time, the Armistead ladies did protect the flag, and not for U.S. patriotism, but again, because it's a family heirloom. But thankfully, they did. If it had fallen into the hands of uh, Confederate activists, we wouldn't have that flag today. Now, the war ends. Country comes together. Early 1870s. We haven't heard much about this flag for years. It's really faded into oblivion. It's not until 1873 when this man, little known to history, brings it out of the shadows. 
That is Commodore George Preble, lifelong Navy man. He's written a book on the history of the U.S. flag. One thing he couldn't figure out, though, was what happened to the original Star Spangled Banner from Fort McHenry. He heard it might be with some Armistead descendants, but he believed something that he read that soldiers were through Fort McHenry in the late 1850s and saw a big flag rolled up in the corner collecting dust. And he speculates that that is the Star Spangled Banner. Well, that brings Georgiana Armistead Hamilton out of the woodwork. She writes him an angry, how dare you letter. How dare you? That was my father's flag. It was in my possession. And Preble's, whoa. But they write back and forth. And after a while, Georgiana's head is turned by the fact that this military man from Boston is interested in her flag. And Preble says, has anyone taken a photo? She says, no. He says, well, if you send it to me here at the Boston Naval Yard, I'll photograph it and send you a copy. She puts it in a crate after all those years, sends it to him. He, he's all excited. He takes it out. He's going to fly it up a flagpole. Takes it out. Whoa, it is really old. 60 years old by now. It, it, it needs a back, it needs some strike, needs a backing. He's in a naval yard. He gets an old ship sail and has some men show a sew a ship sail to the flag to give it strength. And he hangs it from the side of a building. And this is the first flag ever taken of the, the first photo ever taken of the Fort McHenry flag, 1873. You see the damage already, the stars missing. Look at the, the man standing there to show how, how big it is. It also, people always say, it also looks backward, right? Because it is. It was displayed backward for more than 100 years. For reasons we will never know, uh, those men uh, sewed the sail to the front of the flag with the blue shield in the upper left corner. So it was displayed backward for more than 100 years. There is an unintended benefit of that, which I'll get to a little later, but it, it always has, has raised a lot of questions. Now, Preble keeps it for a few years, has a couple of events in Boston, gets a little more notoriety, but still, most people don't know that it even exists. Uh, Georgiana finally says, I want my flag back. 1876, she has moved to New York to live with another son, and it, it goes to their residence. And when she dies in 1878, by the terms of her will, again, family will, it goes to that son, Ebenezer Stuart Appleton. There he is. Ebenezer is a good name for this guy. He's a little bit of a Scrooge. He's prim, he's proper, he's not going to suffer fools. Uh, he's not going to be a good peer. These requests, just what he wanted. There's one he feels he has to accommodate. Baltimore in 1880 is putting up a statue to his grandfather. So he takes the flag, he rides in a parade with it. They're in a wagon. Key's granddaughter is there. Some battle veterans are there. Great event. But he goes back to New York City afterwards. This is 1880. Says, that's it. He locks it in a vault. No one outside the family sees it for 27 years. Not that they didn't try. The Baltimore City Fathers, and in, in, on, on the 75th anniversary, 1889, they want the flag at Fort McHenry, right? There. Can we have the flag? Nope. So they write to the Secretary of War. They go over his head and they say, you know, this isn't really George Armistead's flag. It was never given to him. He, he took it. It's government property. You can get it back. And the Secretary said, I agree with you but possession is nine-tenths of the law. And Eben, uncharacteristically, has his own PR campaign. He invites some New York reporters to his apartment, pulls out a portrait of his grandfather, and says, does this look like the face of a man who would steal government property? Even though he did. And then he gives them this quote. How about this one? The government does not own the flag, and they're demanding it, I think, would equal any despotic notion displayed by the Tsar of Russia. I will loan it where and to whom I please. I will protect it as long as I live and leave it in good hands when I die. No one's getting the flag. But early 20th century, he, Evans getting into his 60s. He's getting tired of this. Uh, he doesn't want to feel the pressure anymore. He's thinking of donating it, maybe Baltimore, maybe the state of Maryland, until a cousin who has a government job down in D.C. says, you know, there's this relatively new National Museum, the Smithsonian. Consider that. National Museum. Evan gets excited right it, really quickly. Within a month, letters back and forth. He decides, he agrees to loan the flag. You can do that. You retain possession, but you loan it. He sends it there in the summer of 1907. The first day, they take it out and hang it from the side of the original Smithsonian building. It's called the castle. That building's still there today. It's, it's the visitor center. And they take this photo, and it's published in newspapers around the country. This is the first time that most people realize the Star Spangled Banner actually exists as a flag from Fort McHenry. It touches off a huge wave of patriotism, visitation to the Smithsonian. Eben is so pleased that five years later, 1912, he makes the gift permanent. With one caveat, it must never leave the Smithsonian. And they agree. 
Two years later, 1914, I think just coincidentally on the 100 year anniversary of the battle, the uh, Smithsonian folks know it's pretty weak. It needs some work, preservation work. The leading flag preservation expert in the country at the time was a lady from Boston named Amelia Fowler. She gets the contract and she and her team are working on the flag. There they are. That's that's in the what's now the visitor center. They conclude that the sail is too heavy. That it, it's causing in itself is causing damage to the flag. So they're going to remove it and attach a much lighter backing of Irish linen. Of course, they attach it to the wrong side, and they also use the, the methodology of the time. They attached it with 1.7 million stitches. One of the current curators said, I can't believe they put 1.7 million stitches in our flag, but that's the way they did it back then. And it did preserve it for almost 90 years. Now, was Evan Appleton's uh, edict that it never leave the Smithsonian ever violated? Once, only once, World War II, 1942, we were concerned about some of our, our most precious items. So items from Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln and the Star Spangled Banner were taken to a warehouse in rural Virginia, kept off campus for two years, returned in 1944. The flag has been on display every day to Americans in some way, shape or form every day since then. Mid 60s, though, the, the Smithsonian's getting pretty cluttered. Look at that stuff all around the flags in the middle and nobody's really seen the full flag since the photo in 1907 because it's in a big case 16 feet high but the flag is 30 feet high so it's folded over you only see eight stripes sony says we're going to make a museum dedicated just to american history the national museum of american history build it around the star spangled banner flag hall was on the second floor this is the way the flag was displayed for about 30 years, from the 60s to the 90s. You see they artificially filled in the stripes and the, and, the, and the star, but you could tell where the original was. And it was dramatic, and they would have big events here, presidential inaugural balls. It was pretty well protected, but they'd check on an occasion. They'd see dust and dirt and threads from people's blue jeans. They knew 1990s, we better do something here to ensure the long-term survival of this, of this piece. Came up with a multi-year, multi-million dollar plan. It was going to take eight years and decide that while they're working on it for those eight years, it'll always be on display. The public will be able to see them working on the flag. So if you visit, you can at least see part of the flag. One of the first things they had to do was take out those 1.7 million stitches, stitch by stitch. Here they are, the lady suspended above the flag. They couldn't touch it one by one. It took them 10 months. And the chief conservator of this project, Suzanne Thomas and Cross, who did such a great job. She was, she said she was looking up one day at the people watching them, and she saw a multi-generational family, older gentlemen, older gentlemen seemed to be from the World War II era. She goes back to her work, looks up about 20 seconds later. He's standing at attention, saluting her. And she said, You know, when you've been doing this for five or six hours, and your back aches and your shoulders ache and your knees ache, that's why you're doing it. You're doing it for the American public. And eight years later, 2008, this display opens. It was so dramatic. You walk down a hallway and get some history of, of key in the, in the battle. And then you see this chamber and you see that flag. And it's just breathtaking. And it's so bright. Why is it so bright? Because the front of it was covered for more than 100 years. That's the benefit to us now of that mistake happening. But, you know, it's, it's really thin. And it, just, it just takes your breath away that it still survives. People dab at tears. And I just, I was standing there once and I thought of all the people who had to work together over the centuries, they couldn't have known each other, obviously, to make sure this still exists. From George Armistead, who thought of it and defended it, to Mary Pickerskill, who made it, to Louisa and Georgiana, who protected it in the early years, Commodore Preble brought it out of the shadows, Ebenezer Appleton, for all his cantankerousness, did the right thing and got it to the Smithsonian, Amelia Fowler for her early preservation efforts. To everyone who's worked on it since then, led by Suzanne Thomas and Krauss and the modern day curator, Jennifer Jones, it's because of their efforts that we can rest assured that our children and our grandchildren and many generations off in the future can go to the Smithsonian and say, our flag is still there. Thank you.